Um, all right, Omkara. Do you say it Omkara? Is that how you yeah. pronounce it? Omkara. Well, it depends on your, where you come from, I guess, but I say Omkara. Mm -hmm. It's not an American R, it's a R more <laughs> sound, but it doesn't matter. Omkara. <laughs> Almost there? <laughs> Almost there. Okay. And is that uh, the, the uh, proper like Sanskrit way to say it or is that the Norwegian say, way to say it? <laughs> I, I'm not gonna claim that I pronounce it the way it's supposed to, but in my, what I've understood is that it's the Norwegian R is closer than the American R. Okay. <laughs> But, you know, my teacher calls me Omkara, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's, he's from America. <laughs> All right, well, thank you again for being willing to be here. I'm really excited to interview you. You've been on the radar for a long time for me. And the part of that is because you're so involved in the international organization that we both uh, serve and teach for. And um, also because our teacher uh, has talked about you like you're this um, cosmic, he, he calls us all cosmic explorers, but you especially, I've heard him talk in that way about. And so that paired with your musicianship and that you have been in a metal band and now are in this 80s cover band, um, just makes me really excited uh, to get to talk consciousness with you, Omkara, because so many people put uh, being a devout spiritual seeker or someone who's actually attained and found something substantial and for real in a box. And, and we, we place it somewhere far away from ourselves. And we believe that there's this cookie cutter version that we're all supposed to kind of try to attain. When in truth, what I have seen and what our teacher encourages is authenticity to be exactly as we are. So I just wonder if you'd be willing to share a little bit initially about how you came to be here, what life was like before, why you were seeking and, and how you came to find yourself uh, as a monk, as a teacher of ascension Sure. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> it could turn into a really long story, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll see if I can, you know, cut it down a little bit. But <clears throat> when you ask the question just now, it, you know, what comes to mind is, is that since I've been, since I was young, I always kind of wanted to find out how the universe works and and one of the defining moments for me as a young boy was uh, during what you would call high school i heard about uh i was you know doing physics class and i heard about einstein's theory of gen gen general relativity and the teacher basically said that this theory is, you know, this is at the forefront of what we know, but it's very complex mathematically. So you have to kind of go to university to study a lot of math and, and stuff in order to get it. And I just remember, like out of the blue, I knew that was what I was going to do. So I, I went down that, you know, path, the academic path, and I studied what I wanted to study, <laughs> which was, you know, black hole physics and, and, and quantum field theory. Um, and, you know, I got to learn the stuff that was, I was hoping I'd learn. But the one thing that I really got from university is that we don't know. We, we don't know how the universe works. And, and by that, I mean that then, like scientists aren't just fumbling in the dark, but what we're, what science is all about basically is finding a model that kind of models reality, the way we perceive it and the way we measure it. 
but there are <laughs> just a lot of stuff that we don't know. So after going down that path, I kind of realized that uh, that wasn't going to give me, you know, the answer, or at least it gave me a very clear in indication that there was something more. There was something else <laughs> kind of we weren't being told. Uh, and so uh, through, uh, yeah, through a series of events, um, I ended up uh, studying a lot of Tai Chi, Qigong, and, and, and you know, Zen meditation and all that stuff until one day a friend told me about this practice and, and kind of here I am. It's, uh, yeah, that's the short story. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, an, it's kind of like, uh, and it's been said many times that you kind of, the more you know, the less, or the more you realize that you don't know kind of thing. And that is, is very much seems to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly can relate to that. Um, as I wrote a list of questions to ask you and just points to cover, I, I, I've been fascinated by how addicted I was to seeking and in the finding how much I don't know. <laughs> you know, it is, it is quite amazing. But I think part of it is you start to see the gaps in the structure if you will um and it's 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 not that it's a bad thing it's just that or i can only speak for me is you see that it's more there's definitely more <laughs> and and you know with the meditation practice you start to actually experience that in in ways that you can't really well, you can talk about it and you can kind of put ideas around it and, you know, color it and tell stories about it. But ultimately, even those beautiful stories need to go, kind of, that's models too. Like, my, my kind of path, at least in the start, was through science, like hard science, like physics and math and stuff like that but the same goes for you know your inner life like as we grow up we start constructing models of who we are and how we're supposed to react and how we're supposed to you know i can do this but not this i'm this but not this and you know we have these models in here too it's the same thing basically and and more than anything, you start to see the gaps in that structure, that it's not necessarily true, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's beautifully put. Um, so I'm just going to interject right now quickly that we're talking about the Bright Path Ashaya's Ascension Techniques, and Omkara and I both practice them and are privileged to get to teach them to other folks in a weekend event called the First Fear Course. Um, I started practicing Ascension in 1999, Omkara, and uh, went through a teacher training process in, in 2000 to 2001, and then, um, kind of took a break for a while and, and was exploring life, both using the practice and being in touch with teachers and not. And it was a very interesting time of um, uh, uh, experimenting and research in what life is like being devoted to my highest desire and in using tools that will effectively take me to that experientially in an experiential way and not what life is like not getting my eyes closed and not being in touch with others and then in 2010 um really recommitted myself and uh really started being a uh a surrendered student again and got to teach again and um it's been such an awesome journey of seeing the gaps, like you said, seeing the 
even in the identification as this person trying to wake up or waking up, <laughs> all the gaps in the construct of even that. So, um, so I would just love to hear a little bit about, as you came at this from a really different angle than I did, uh, and yet the experience is often very similar. So what can you tell me or us about the path as it has been of discovery, of finding that experience beyond you being a very intellectual, hard fact, science-based dude, um, you know, what has it been like to step away from your comfort zone maybe of, of thinking your way through and knowing into dropping into experience? Yeah. Um, well, at least for me, it's, it's, it's been like a journey of, of dropping old habits, if you will. Because as you said, I, I have a very <laughs> or highly analytical mind and um, everything that pops up kind of, or at least used to be seen as, as, as things that needs to be figured out or, uh, you know, solved and problems that need to be solved and stuff like that. And uh, it is to think about all that stuff like the, the grinder going on in your head is, 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 is a habit. And uh, it seems to me it doesn't really matter if, if you're a very analytical person like me or if you're like a very emotionally driven person or however your you know, unique flavor is. Uh, it's, when you look at it closely, it's the same mechanism. It's, it's, it's as you said, you kind of, at some point you identify with something and it's important to you. So you start pondering it or think about it or, you know, um, so, um, it's, yeah, that's the best way I can put it really. Like you start to see, or to put it this way, and I, I'm going to put a little <laughs> scientific twist on this is that, In the universe, like what we see, like the, what we see, what we experience as the physical universe, there's a principle, and it's that every system will will kind of seek it, the lowest energy state. It's a natural thing for any physical system. It wants to be in the lowest energy state where it can rest. Right? It's it, the analogy would be if you have like a, a ping pong ball in a in like a big ball and you drop it, it wants to rest at the bottom, you know? The only place in the universe where that doesn't happen is here. <laughs> and, and, and at some point you just realize that the habit you have of, of thinking, it takes energy, it takes effort. And it's such a, you could say it's kind of freeing when you just let that go because that effort goes away and you can relax and you do that and you see stuff you're holding on to and you let it go and you kind of continue doing that. And in that process, you become more intimate with what's already here. You know, if you can imagine letting in everything go, like every idea you ever had, every idea about even this moment, if you just let it go, and see what's left. Um, then, you know, I could probably say at least 10 things about it, but that's not really the point. The point is for whoever is listening to this to discover that for themselves and see that it's that, you know, we as teachers and, you know, the spiritual masters and all that, we're, we're kind of, we're not lying but you got to find it out for yourself that right now you can rest. And it's unlike, um, it's not a kind of a everyday experience if you're not familiar with that, you know, the space now. But having said that, I just want to point out that the experience of resting now 
isn't something like mystical or special or something you have to kind of sit in a cave for 10 years <laughs> to discover? In fact, as you know, um, it's, 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 it's a very natural thing and, and people fall in and out of it all the time. It's just that you kind of never recognize it. You know, some people like walking in the woods and feel the kind of the, the peace just <laughs> settle. Or some people go fishing or some people mountain climb or, you know, some sort of activity. And in the middle of that, they can experience peace. But it's kind of like it's, it's always, or not always, but often it's connected to the activity, not like the inner experience of that. So basically, it's a very natural thing, but at the same time, we're so used to, we're so habitual thinkers, you know, we're so used to processing and thinking about stuff that it kind of, we need some kind of tool to, to help us, you know, get back. <laughs> Yeah, and I love that you say get back. We call this the path of return and that ascension, the whole practice of ascension is based on practical tools that just simply do that, rehabituating us to that natural state that we were born in, which was pure, pure experiencing life, I feel. Would you agree? Yeah. Um, so, um, so some of the stuff that you said, Omkara, of course, is my experience, but I remember in about 1999, and I was in a really rough space, I felt like I knew that we, there was something more, I felt that this, this urgency and this import in purpose in life, and yet everything that was on the outside was just a mess, and my head was a mess, and my emotions were a mess, and um, I remember reading actually one of the books from our uh, teacher's teacher. And I threw the book across the room because I had already read Deepak Chopra, I'd read Marianne Williamson, I'd, I'd read other people saying these things. And I was really, I really wanted to believe what you said about this isn't some mystical thing and it's accessible for anybody who has the desire and the right tools and guidance. But I felt so far away from that because all I knew was to try to get it here, you know? So I threw this book across the room and while you were talking, I had a flashback about that and how, how many people sometimes I speak with who are like, well, that's great for you, Rodasi, you know? You're like talking in riddles to me right now. That's not <laughs> my, you know, that's not my experience. And I'm like, sometimes I just say simple things like, okay, I know I'm using words that seem like it's far out there. Like for example, living in the present moment or, or being aware or just let go or surrender. But can you be aware of your body sitting where it's sitting right now? And just for that instant, people stop and go, whoa, yeah, that, how do I do that more? So, um, but initially they get, they get angry, they get frustrated. Can you just speak about that a little bit? Do you, have you found that? Um, well, part of, you know, when I told about my kind of little path towards, you know, where I am now, part of that was uh, <laughs> included um, after I'd finished my, my um, master's degree, included like, about three, four years of, of panic attacks and anxiety. As a result of, you know, wanting to discover more of truth, um, I, um, I started experimenting with psychedelics. And uh, that kind of <laughs> didn't play out well for me. <laughs> You know, uh, so the end of the story was that I was left with a very unpleasant state of, of anxiety and panic attacks. And, you know, that was really what kind of kicked my butt, you know, to really start looking into other stuff because I was suffering quite a bit, 
so you know that that fire to you know i don't want this <laughs> I need to get somewhere like quick that's what kind of started like the more spiritual side of things because they for example i started in chinese medicine because they had you know a different viewpoint and they said okay we can help you with this whereas the kind of the western medicine like psychiatry they would just give me some pills that didn't really work and you know some side effects that wasn't pleasant anyway uh, that's what kind of started the whole thing so i i can put it this way i clearly identify with you know that's not my experience now but still there was a part of me that wanted and kind of knew that peace was possible even in the midst of that you know turmoil if you will um and that i think that's kind of essential you kind of have to want and it may sound brutal but you kind of have to want to walk the path even how much if you're hurting a ton or you know you have to be willing to walk towards something and i know that there are certain states of where you know the light goes just goes out and there's no <laughs> there's no light anywhere not even at the end of the tunnel so I, I totally can see that it's not easy, but for me in that time period, just knowing, hearing some, someone saying that it is possible, it's not. And you know, this was even from people who were living with anxiety when I kind of researched that, uh, who weren't spiritual at all, but what they said was, the way out of this is is you know accepting it and coping with it and you can kind of only cope with anxiety now because anxiety is very kind of future driven <laughs> because you get anxiety about getting anxiety so it becomes <laughs> like a very quick downward spiral and that kind of disappears if you're able to to be not going to the future and not going to the past either because you know the, the past in this case having having had uh, anxiety or panic attacks kind of justified a potential future of having uh, anxiety attacks so it became like the self in reinforcing thing going back and forth you know every time okay don't go into the future <laughs> You know, you we kind of look into the past, yes, but look here and you, so yeah, it's basically not very pleasant. Um, but the thing is, well, I can only, again, I can only speak from my experience that if you continue walking, you will kind of, at some point you kind of have to give up. And, and, and the, <laughs> it sounds kind of corny and like spiritual and, and stuff, but as a, a solution will present itself. Because my path towards meditation was a psychiatry, psychologist, uh, Chinese medicine kind of uh, tipped me about going to Qigong and Tai Chi. And at this Tai Chi and Qigong thing, I met a friend who were, she was ascending, but she never, she never talked about it, but she went to, to become a teacher and then she got back. Um, and that's like an incredible chain of events of people that didn't know of each other, but I was kind of just following the, where they were pointing and I ended up here. Um, but I'll, I'll, there's another thing I wanted to say about that because all these things, it, I don't pretend to say that meditation will immediately solve every problem you have. And I think you, you agree with that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like you learn 
go to your first sphere and suddenly it's all angels and unicorns and stuff like that. <laughs> so. <laughs> so all these things I was just talking about in order to kind of get rid of the anxiety, they helped. They really did. Like the Chinese medicine and the Qigong and the psychology, you know, talking to a grown up <laughs> about these things and stuff like that. It really helped. Like the symptoms got way better and I could kind of, you know, <sighs> breathe a little bit. Um, but it wasn't until I kind of really started doing this meditation thing and, and you know, ascension that something started to shift and it wasn't like the anxiety just disappeared it was that the relationship to it changed the relationship to the energy that came when you have a panic attack and the relationship to the thoughts and all that it changed and without me kind of even notice noticing it it kind of just disappeared and, and so like, it, it's like anxiety free. It's not like it's kind of murmuring somewhere in the background there, it's, it's gone. Now, but yeah, and this is kind of an important point, I feel at least. I still had panic attacks. Like I would have like out of the blue and everything would come back and it would go like, <gasps> but I was able to not, grab onto it like I need to fix this oh no not again oh poor me and it's gonna be hell for a week now you know all those thoughts and the energies and all the stuff I was by grace I should say <laughs> I was able to take a step back and the panic attack came and went like in 90 seconds and that was it so it wasn't like that meditation for me kind of remove the potential for you know bad stuff to happen it was that it changed <laughs> the relationship to that whole thing so that when bad stuff happened it i let it happen and then i let it go because to at, at least in my mind when anxiety would rise my mind would immediately kick in and how do i fix this and in that, there's like a library of concepts and ideas and what do I do and all that that comes with it. And in like no time, you're inside the story. And it's not very, for anyone who's experienced that, you know, anxiety and panic attacks, it's not a very pleasant story to be in the middle of. <laughs> and the story makes the energy like more consuming. Oh, yeah. In my experience, yeah. I think this is so key because what I, I know was true for me and what I see in a lot of folks is that we have this misconception about what peace actually is, what being awake actually is, and also what stress is. And part of that is that we're really confused about if I am to be awake, then I'm never going to have any problems again. Everything's going to be like this conditional peace, you know, like nothing bad will ever happen. I'll never feel jealousy again. I'll never have a, a negative thought again. If I do have those things, then I somehow am, am off track. And, um, and so to educate people, to just say, hey, you know, you, you've got it a little backwards. You know, could you just talk about that a little bit? If you get what I'm saying here, if you're following me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those spiritual concepts, I guess. That, um, an enlightened master uh, doesn't experience any pain or problems or anything at all. Uh, and it becomes kind of like, uh, it's, it's, it's something that we kind of inherited <laughs> in terms of like the, the lotus, you know, the yogi sitting in full lotus somewhere in the Himalayas and just, um, and everything is well, right? Uh, but it doesn't seem to, like, we're born humans. We're gonna experience things 
as humans. And, 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 and it's not a bad thing, you know, that's kind of the main point. <laughs> it's not a bad thing being born human. You're, you, you know, you're going to have experiences. I have experiences, you have experiences. Our teacher, he has experiences. It's, it's you know, and why wouldn't you? <laughs> It's, uh, it's not about, at least for me, it's not about that at all. And, and some experiences, if you kind of judge them, it's, it's going to be not as pleasant, pleasant as if you don't. But ultimately, it's, it's like, I think you mentioned it earlier on, that this is a path of return. And as a friend of mine said, it's a path of return. It's not the path of why the hell did I forget, which is, <laughs> which is, you know, very different thing. It's, and basically any valid meditation technique, that's just what it does. It, it brings you back. And you know, if, if, if you think that when we talk about uh this present moment and all that stuff it's look you can look at it this way it takes you to a place where you don't go think about the past or the future we just call it the present moment it's what's here right um and it's a return to this place like and you make that choice and make that choice and make that choice and come more and more easy and automatic and you and you get to kind of experience life from here which is a totally different experience from experience life if you're constantly let's say thinking about the future so that everything you experience right now is kind of colored by shades that have like a future tinge to them <laughs> or a past if you choose to do that um, I don't know if that answered the question at all, but <laughs> you know, I actually have no idea. But um, but you are you are uh, my attention is riveted in and there's an expansion going on. It's good stuff, even whether it answered the question or not. So thank you. <laughs> but I do I do want to go back to a couple things you mentioned, and and there is an air of both discipline and focus and like no nonsense as well as an air of gentleness and surety and grace and then you use the word grace so could you just talk about how first of all i hear you saying that this is available for anybody no matter what the circumstances are you know good bad uncomfortable that somebody has to be willing to walk toward it and and be willing kind of to be courageous enough to walk toward it and want it bad enough. And yes, many of us are very motivated by pain. And then um, to have an effective tool, uh, which we've been talking about our practice is ascension, but like you said, any valid meditative tool that allows for you to effectively and clearly return to the present moment. And for me, guidance has been essential in that. Um, but part of i just was reading arjuna's book a friend of ours a fellow um, monk and teacher of ascension arjuna shaya wrote this book 200 percent and he's talking about the what it takes also and to 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 kind of be devoted to this different state so i'd love to talk to you about that that one-pointedness and the grace the gentleness and the grace. Could, could you just talk about that? Hmm. <laughs> Let me see. Yeah, I think what comes up now, as you mentioned, is that uh, um, <laughs> we get motivated by pain. And, and, and I've seen that a lot, like people that kind of have uh, a, a good life they don't experience any problems and stuff like that they kind of they're not that interested in meditation you know <laughs> it's 
because why would they? I have, you know, I have no problems. Um, but I, you know, I think like that dedication and, and the discipline you mentioned, it's, uh, it's a little tricky for me to talk about because I've always been that guy. I, I usually say that I don't have any talents. I, I have discipline. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, I, I'm a drummer and uh, not like a natural drummer. I just wanted to play drums. So I, I stayed in the basement and, you know, practicing five hours a day because yeah, I, for no other reason that's, and that's what I kind of do. It was easy for me to do that. I didn't have like, I didn't have to tell myself to do it. It was kind of like a discipline, but it was still, yeah um so you're naturally very like disciplined in that way like that's just part of your makeup it seems to be that yes yeah sure so i'm also i'm very fond of ascending and 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 will can easily spend two three hours you know a day ascending and that doesn't necessarily relate to people you know, with the bus, BC life and, and, uh, and that kind of stuff when you tell people about this. But it's, it's kind of, it, it needs, as you were talking about, it needs some kind of incentive and some kind of drive because you kind of need to do it. You know, the only way I know that ascension doesn't work or any meditation practice doesn't work is if you don't do it. <laughs> you kind of need that. It, it's kind of like the bottom, bottom line, if you will. You, if if you don't want that or you don't do that, and you know, then it's not going to get you anything. And it may be because you kind of haven't found your path or whatever. But uh, at some point, if you want to discover more about who you are and kind of what's going, really going on, you need that. You need that drive at least. And you need kind of the, I used to discipline in a very broad sense here, but you kind of need some discipline to just do it. And the thing is, The more you do it, the less of a chore it becomes. You know what I mean? Because sometimes, you know, I, I don't have time for this, blah, 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 blah. But if you do it, just continue doing it, it will be the one thing in your day where you kind of, oh, so it becomes something you want to do. But um, people are different, you know? People have different experiences and different lives and different, goals, if you will. Some people will come to Ascension just wanting to have a tool that will help them sleep. Some people will have come to Ascension in order to have a tool that help them have a better relationship. And some people come to Ascension in order to like <laughs> go all the way, you know, to really see how, <laughs> how deep the rabbit hole goes. And, you know, Ascension and any valid meditation technique will provide that for you. That's pretty amazing, eh? It is. I think it was MSI who said that the well goes deep, like, and it will provide water for everyone, you know, everyone who wants to drink from this source, no matter how deep you will go. So, yeah. And people, people are different, but it's, it's, it's kind of like, and this is one of the things I, again, you mentioned it early on in this interview. It's one of the things I really love about, how should I put this, our community of teachers, like the teach, at least the teachers that I know and know of, is that we're wildly different people. <laughs> We have we come from every walk of life and, and kind of an infinite variation of life experiences. 
And the chances are you'll meet the teacher that will can help you, can bring you something. At least that's been my experience. When I've been willing to kind of ask someone about something, it's been the right person to talk to you for some reason. <laughs> yeah that's pretty magical and you're right i mean i uh it, from the emptiest and fullest place in the experience for me to taste the flavors of of that consciousness in each teacher to to in each person really but um anytime i'm i'm communing with you know in conversation with another ashaya or someone who's who's clear about what the present moment is, who's clear about their true nature, you know, that has a clear experience of that. Their flavor is so palpable for me. And um, there's no, no two that are alike. And like you said, that gives a broad, broad range of, of, of possibility for when experiences show up in life and we have questions because we don't know, like, I don't know, I've never been here before. I've never done this before. I've never experienced this before. How does one traverse this, you know? And, and so could you talk about how important it has been to have guidance in using the effective tool that you have and in just life, having, having clear mirrors to turn to? How important has that been for you? It's been, uh... Uh, the words word that comes up is, is super important <laughs> you know it's even with kind <clears throat> with a flawless uh, uh, practice and, and approach there is always 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 uh, potential for the mind to grab onto something and make it about that like it will this is truth, you know, and um, having someone mirroring that to you, showing that, okay, so, so you're, you're, you're holding on to something here. Oh, I didn't see that. I didn't see that. And, and you know, with clear mirrors, as you say, that's, that's so important because it's so easy. Like, the mind can get so subtle, like your inner voices can tell you this very, can be either be malicious or beautiful, it doesn't really matter, but kind of just whisper behind your ear and it's very soft and quiet and comforting. <laughs> and it kind of doesn't see it until somebody, your mirror, just, well, what, what's that behind your ear there, you know? <laughs> Oh shit, I did not see that. But again, so yeah, the, the short answer is guidance is, is crucial. Simply because left to our own, our own devices, devices, it seems that we kind of will make it about something other than the pure experiencing of this moment, if you can use that term. It's beautiful. Yeah. You, you, and and but you have to be kind of humble because <laughs> you know your ego seldom wants to ask for a reflection because it likes to or my ego at least <laughs> likes to think it's right you know i got this now yeah Ooh. but i i just remember for some reason and this kind of illustrates a little bit about, you know, how subtle it can be. Um, because I was, I was with my teacher and I had this question that I really didn't want to ask <laughs> because um, I, um, I knew the answer. And I didn't want to look like a fool in front of my teacher, you know? And so I was, you know, talking to him and I was kind of like, 
I really need to ask this question. I, I, I just couldn't get words out. It was like a struggle to actually say <laughs> what, a simple sentence. And, but I managed to ask the question and his answer was exactly <laughs> what I thought it was saying. But that wasn't the thing. It was the willingness, at least I had, or I can't take credit for it really, because there was something that kind of forced the question out. But I was willing to let go of the, the, the wanting to not do it kind of thing. And it was one of the most profound moments in my life, simply just doing that. Even though the mind had kind of figured out how this was going to play out, and it did kind of, but something happened there. And, and uh, at, at least to me, that's the value of a clear mirror, you know. Omkara, um, I can relate to that. I've had, I've had similar things um, occasionally being, being in a, you know, in a meeting with our teacher and my arm goes up and I know what's about to come out of my mouth and I know the answer to it. And I'm like, why am I asking this? You know? <laughs> okay, whatever. Uh, and it just, yeah, um, sometimes I tell my students, I tell people sometimes in car, it's stuff doesn't make sense to the mind or there there can even be like um fear used to stop me a lot from from joyous expression or bold expression and um certainly being in a room of a hundred people and sharing your most intimate uncontrolled self is very good for demolishing the habits of the ego <laughs> and um I have had sweaty armpits and been shaking and, you know, the, the uncontrollable need to express and not even know what was going to happen other times, you know, and um, those have been the, the most beautiful moments of my life as far as growth and recognizing, first of all, that I can... Um, be used as a conduit by the universe in ways that I, I don't know what's going on, but I'm willing to show up and do it anyway. And the ways that I've learned how that reflects back in my daily life, allowing me not to be so attached to having to be comfortable or in the know, or, you know, just to be able to be free ultimately. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I would say that that impulse for me is grace. It's the Holy Spirit. And um, I see that in you. You know, I don't know you very well, but I have admired your perseverance and your consistency and your no nonsense. You know, this is what I've seen just minimally in the work that you do for our organization. And um, I wonder how you see grace playing out in a couple of areas in your life specifically, because this inquiring mind wants to know, uh, because I'm so into music, I love music so much. So I wonder how, how this all plays out in your relationship to being on stage and playing drums with the band that you play with, and then also how it plays out in your relationship. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that's like another two hours. So. I know, right? <laughs> no, uh, it's, it's, you know, with the music thing, it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, a lot of musicians will kind of, when they perform, fall into a, a state where it could, we tend to call it flow. But it's, for me, it's the same thing as when, when you're just present. But it, it, like the scientific term for it, like for the people that do science on this stuff, it's, it's usually called flow. And so a lot of musicians have that. And for some musicians, it's like why they play sometimes, you know, getting on stage and, and not think about anything, just play, not even think about what you're playing. It's, like something else takes over and you're just performing. 
So there is that element of it, but at the same time, like the band that I do most of the gigs with, it's uh, it's an 80s cover band. And um, and some of the songs I've played probably 1,500, 2,000 times. So uh, that kind of, the mind would tend to get easily bored with that because it knows it, you know, oh, not again. And of course those thoughts come, but by basically practicing ascension, if you will, it doesn't matter, kind of, it, it, you can't get bored if you're not, you know, going back and forwards and forwards in time, just playing. And so basically, and this is where, you know, the spiritual rubber hits the road, if you will. How do you apply your meditation practice in daily life, you know? And, and um, I find that ascension or, you know, for me, it's, it's very, it's the great equalizer, if you will. Like, it doesn't even matter if you're playing like a small audience of 50 people or a big stage, outdoor stage for 7,000 people. The experience of now is much the same. Like everything, the experience itself is different, but the experiencing, you know, what's, kind of if i can put it this way who or wh whatever is experiencing this doesn't change <clears throat> and that just makes the whole thing a lot more fun and easy as you know that's the best way i can put it now this also at least for me applies to uh, when i walk to take the train when I go shopping, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't really um, dis it doesn't kind of distinguish between the different what's what's going on the different experiences. And isn't that what we're all really after is the ability to unconditionally and consistently and just know a, a, a unbroken peace, the peace that passeth understanding and I could also call that presence, you know, that I don't have to only know that with my eyes closed sitting on a meditation cushion when everything's quiet. It's very revolutionary and strange for people to hear like, no, no, you can experience this in the midst of activity, no matter if things are really intense and enjoyable or intense and not enjoyable to the mind or very mundane. And so I really love that you you brought that up because I heard Deepak Chopra uh, was interviewed by Oprah and um, he was talking about that state. And he said, you know, I'm experiencing it right now. And Oprah said, no, no, don't leave me to go wherever you're going. And he said, no, no, that's not what I'm, that's not what we're doing here. You know, it's very accessible to just be noticing that right now and um and, and from the, the surface level of the mind it's difficult to to get that but there is some science that talks about that as well and i know in different cultures that that meditative state of course is one thing when we have our eyes closed but i wonder if you could talk a little bit right now about that state with eyes open and scientifically speaking. Um, well, for some reason, what pops up again is, is the flow thing. Um, and, and basically, there's this the, there's this author who kind of researched a lot of extreme sports um what do you call them practitioners or people who, who do extreme sports and they kind of they what they report is that in the midst, midst of this activity that they're doing if they're not present they die 
<laughs> so there's a very strong incentive to stay present, right? And, and how they describe it is very much a piece of inner peace, or a state of inner peace. It's very peaceful, even though you're kind of, <laughs> you're in the middle of a, you know, 30 foot wave that's about to crush you. But still there's this state of, of inner peace and there's a flow and you don't, you're basically, it's not you that is, um, you're not kind of doing whatever gets done. Um, in terms of, you know, the hard science, and there's this, they've done a lot of, of, of brain scans uh, and a lot of functional, both where they kind of look at what happens to people that meditate regularly, like in the physical um, changes that goes on in, in, inside the brain, but also in terms of functionality where they kind of scan uh, brains that, um, while they're meditating. So they, they see areas in the brain light up uh, when people meditate and they kind of can correlate that to, to certain emotional states, for example, like um, people that meditate a lot, there's a lot of activity in the center of the brain, which is also very active in people who are very happy for some reason like for some by some reason i mean that they may be just in love or you know people that are happy um and so there's there you don't have to search deep and hard on on google or youtube to find some uh researchers showing their results of this and it's not like um, like a hocus pocus <laughs> research either it's, it's serious people and you know it's harvard and and stuff like that these are not crackpots trying to promote some new age new thing this is hard science and so i would actually encourage people to 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 look at that because it's for example a decade or two ago it was believed that you couldn't change the brain after a certain age when you were kind of 20 something then it was everything was finally developed and that's it and then you die kind of <laughs> but now it turns out if you meditate you increase the gray area in the brain the you know the portion of the brain that where where the um, brain cells are like the actual neurons and that's like what how does that work you know you're kind of focusing your mind and you're basically relaxing and your brain changes like physically that's amazing but even more amazing is is, is when you talk to the people who learn to to uh, meditate what's their experience of it how does it change their experience of life and if you look at the statistics of it it's it's very positive <laughs> you know? so, but i find that with all this kind of at least for me it's uh, convincing evidence that that uh, meditation is a good thing at least try it you know that doesn't necessarily um, help <laughs> because as, as we mentioned before if you have like say you're happy then why should you meditate you know usually it's when you hit a bump or something or you're stressed or whatever that's when you want to learn to meditate so yeah i don't know <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> it's it's kind of like human nature to like yeah 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 it's fine yeah yes it's a good thing but it's not for me 
people will show up when they show up. Yeah, it's, I definitely see the perfection in everyone being wherever they're at. I get really excited when people want to jump on this dance floor though, you know, with us and, <laughs> That's and nice way of putting it. <laughs> like really, and take the risk of finding out, can I just, can I, can I employ this? And like you said earlier, see how far the rabbit hole goes. I know, I know people who use meditation or have used ascension like, um, like modern day medicine, you know, to fix whatever's going on in their life. And then when life gets better, they put it down and come back to it when they need it. No. And um, I don't have any judgments on that, but I can't use it that way personally. That's just my dharma, my, my past, you know, it's just different. Um, I've watched people though, um, Amkara, uh, take ascension into their system, into their life and create a new habit of getting their eyes closed, which then creates everything that their heart's greatest desire wanted, including myself. And if you can imagine a girl who was suicidal and anxious and depressed and constantly giving herself away in many, many ways, not feeling comfortable in her own body, not knowing how to be present and not thinking that the body was worth much and um, lovely, but a mess, you know, that was me. And wanting so badly to know peace and love, real, true, unconditional love. And uh, to feel like what I would see, a woman who is dignified and just comfortable in her own skin, right? I wanted that, whatever it took to get that. And I've seen other women like me and men too, who have been a basket case and a wreck and PTSD and um, all manner of state come and just say, I hope this works. I don't know, I hope it works. And take the risk, you know, take the risk to find out and to, to commit to implementing it. And then, you know, I'm sure you've seen within a weekend, watch hmm. people like the ping pong ball start to start to get a little bit of oh I can rest right here and their eyes change and their skin changes you know and their ability to be present changes in just a couple of days right yeah, that's beautiful put beautiful put so I I did want to hear about I, I guess let's talk about love for a moment and i don't just mean love in relationship but i do want to hear how this plays out between you and and your your goddess lady partner <laughs> and um what the like a teaching on love if you could what i thought love was at one time what i thought i was after the way i treated relationships and myself in relationships has changed so much and coming to find what real love actually is and that it's not conditional and it's also not about the other person. And I wonder how Ascension has given you anything similar to that in your experience and in particular with your relationship. Uh, it's, it's basically the same story. Uh, at least the way I see it now, like, Full unconditional love is already present, right? It's, it's just that we tend to put on these glasses, <laughs> it gets tinted or colored or distorted or whatever. But for me, in the, in the relationship, is is uh, basically I'm in a relationship with Ati Devi. She's an, she is also a teacher of ascension. And, and the one, the most important relationship in our relationship is 
my relationship with the silence and her relationship with the silence. That's where we start. And, um, and you could argue that that's the same as your relationship to your teacher. But the, kind of like the relationship with, between the two of us, it comes second, you know? <laughs> and, and that's just both like a very freeing thing and it's also very humbling and it's, uh, it's basically, he then turns into a mirror for me. And it's, it's amazing because in a relationship, as you probably know, uh, that's kind of where your buttons get pushed <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's natural, you know, it's part of being human again. Like you, you get into the person and, and, and that's where kind of like all your positions get kind of visible. But I, I, as you mentioned too, like I've discovered that all the, all my problems with my girlfriend is my basically my problems. And I'm not saying that it's yes there and yes you're right there and you know that <laughs> <laughs> because that would be kind of holding on to like a spiritual concept that I don't get upset because I'm so conscious, which is bullshit. Uh, but it's, it's, it's you say what's there for you to say in that moment. You don't hold back. And when your partner is with you on this, like we're on the same, like the silence is the most important thing. Then you have a chance to actually see what's there, what, what is there for you. And I'm not talking about it in, in like an egoic sense that what do I get out of this? But it's, it's just what happens when, when you have an argument or uh, a discussion or whatever, or you disagree or agree or whatever. And so it's, it's a very beautiful thing. And in that, at least, the way I see it now is there's a huge amount of love, right? It's, um, love isn't what I thought it was. <laughs> because we have these ideas of romantic love and, and you know, it's, it's part of the picture too, but it's, it isn't a bigger part as you would think. Like love is so much more. So, but again, it's kind of the same story over again in all situations in life. There is the recognition, at least the way I see it, that everything or everything you ever wanted, or at least I should say everything I ever wanted is here now. And I know that sounds woo, perhaps new agey, but it can be an experience. It is an experience. Everything I ever wanted is as present now as it ever was and ever will be. It's just a matter of coming back to this and, and you know, not <laughs> kind of leave. And if I do leave, I'll just come back. And that, you know, if it's peace, love, joy, it's, it's like we got, we got taught the whole thing upside down. And that all these things are things we need to go and search for, which, you know, up to a certain point serves a purpose. But there comes a point, and I'm sure you know this, <laughs> that when you just stop looking and when you just stop searching, when you just are able to be content now, you see that <laughs> it's right here in its fullest expression, not just a part of it, like the whole thing. And that goes in relationships, in, in work, in whatever happens in your life, big or small. Mm. 
I have like 500 other questions I'd love to ask you specific to quantum physics and stuff, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to right now. I hope to get to, to do that some other time. Sure. What I'd love is that was a beautiful note to almost end this on. I'd like to just ask if you could share maybe a question or two or a pearl of wisdom to leave for anyone who who might have their heart being pulled forward in the hope that there really is something substantial and real in what you've shared and what we've we've been uh, expressing here any any last word of wisdom or question or anything that you have for somebody who might be about to step over that threshold down the rabbit hole yeah it's it's kind of what i would say is that if you find something that speaks to you then go for it kind of don't at least try it out for real and at the same time we're not lying like i'm not and you're not sitting here making this up this are these are real experiences but at the same time don't take my word for it you know you my word is like this this much much importance compared to uh your experience so uh, <laughs> i can only say that it's worth it but still you gotta you gotta try to self thank you Ankara. and one way that people can just one option and the option that we wound up taking was to look up thebrightpath.com and find a course in your area or create one. You know, we have teachers all over the world who would love to create a course around you. And um, if that doesn't resonate for you, then find one. And like Omkara said, commit to it. Like really try it out. Don't just go, well, you know, I took this thing, but it didn't work for me when really you didn't try it for real. You didn't for real give it your all. So um, www.thebrightpath.com, look up, you know, look at the videos and the inspiration there, look up a course, contact one of the teachers. All of the teachers have bios on the website and um, any of us would love to connect with you. Yeah. And I, I would just like to add one thing, kind of what the, the one thing, and we're talking about Ascension specifically now, the one thing that sold me was how effective it was. Because for me, I tried other meditation techniques before, and I've had experiences of peace. You know, after 20 minutes of meditation, I would just go totally still and oh but when i learned the first technique it was like i don't know minute minute and a half and it was the same experience and to my you know <laughs> analytical mind it was holy shit this is really effective you know so i was sold <laughs> so if there are anybody out there with that kind of yeah mindset yeah it's effective yeah and and we didn't even say it's used with the eyes open too which um it's a game changer it, yeah it's total game changer i mean it, it it allows for us to recognize that experience in our daily life which is everything oh thank you so much for your time today i think you're amazing i really appreciate it Thank you. It was awesome. And, and as I said before you started recording, this is, this is so cool what, you, what you're doing. I just love it. Very cool thing. Thank you, Amkara. All right, brother. Well, I'm going to say goodbye and I'm going to stop recording right now.